let's give God praise all over the house tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. I know we have gone to the Lord in prayer tonight. I would like us to, I know we have prayed for him already, but let's pray that God would touch Bishop Wilbanks this week. Also, uh, we need to pray for Brother Tim Bolin. Uh, got a little situation, but God is well able. Anybody ever had a miracle in the house tonight? How I many know that God is well able? Would you just lift your hands and let's lift our voice and let's pray for these. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask you right now to touch Bishop Wilbanks. God, he's got to preach this weekend. God, we need a complete healing. We need a full touch in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you for your faithful attendance to the house of God. Uh, there's a number of people that are very sick as you pray this week. Let's lift them to the Lord in prayer. Um, seems like everybody's got it. Everybody's got it. So if you've got it, well, I hope you're not here tonight if you got it because the rest of us don't want it. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. somewhat of a lengthy reading here hang in there be tough it's the word of God James chapter 4 verse 1 if you're there say amen from whence cometh come wars and fightings among you now this is interesting because James is not writing to sinners James is writing to the people of God these are Holy Ghost filled Jesus name baptized from whence come wars and fightings among you come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members that word lust there is uh, the Greek word epitumio epitumio uh, epi epi like epidermis it, it's the layer that covers your whole body uh, epi is also used to describe things that are that are big. It's big. It's huge. It's talking about desires that are too big. Inordinate desires. It's talking about desire that's it's covering everything. Epitumeo. From whence come? This is where fightings are coming from. They come from your lust that war in your members. Ye epitumio, ye lust, and have not. This is the children of God. Ye kill. Same concept here. And desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. Yet he, you have not because ye ask not. He's talking about prayer right here. Everybody stay with me for just a second. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. He's talking about prayer right here. Still talking about prayer. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. Listen to this, the next four words. That ye may consume. That ye may consume. Say those words with me that ye may consume that ye may consume it upon your epitumio your lusts that are out your desires that are out of control sobering here we're all this is a letter to us that you can pray and be so amiss even in your praying and the thing that's driving you being amiss is a consumer spirit. We'll preach for just a little bit. We'll finish reading this, but we're, I'll give you my title now. I'm going to preach about answering God's call, overcoming the spirit of a consumer. Overcoming the spirit of a 
consumer. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Then he begins to talk about consumers, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. This is a scriptural technique. It's a scriptural technique. Friendship, enmity. If you're friends of the world, you're the enemy of God. Whosoever therefore will be, this is what he says, will be on one hand a friend of the world. It's juxtaposed. On one hand a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture saith in vain the spirit talking about a fleshly spirit that dwelleth in us, lusteth or desires to envy. But he, talking about God, he giveth more grace. That's an important word. It's Tuesday night. We're breaking this down while we're reading it. That word grace is charis. He giveth charis. He giveth giftedness. God gives a giftedness to deal with all of these things. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace, or gives giftedness unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. I like that word, resist. It means fight him. We'll just use modern-day language. Punch the devil. Kick the devil. Scratch the devil. Bite him. Fight. Fight the devil, and he will flee from you. Here's how you do it. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. God speaks to both ends. you got to fight this end, and you got to be friends with this end. You're either friend with the world or you're friend with God. You're either the enemy of the world or the enemy of God. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted. Notice this. This goes... This goes, the, the song that we sing, uh, he's turned my mourning into dancing, or how he has turned my sorrow into joy, that's a true song. But this verse is true too. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. <laughs> Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Wait, we sing that in the other direction. And that's true. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Bottom line, when it comes to turning our, our morning into dancing, it's much better if he turns it into dancing than if we turn it into dancing. His joy is far greater than the joy that I can produce on my own. Hallelujah. Let's preach about overcoming the spirit of a consumer for just a little while tonight. And let's pray before we're seated. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your great spirit, your great touch. There's nobody like you, God, and we stand in your presence, needing you, relying on you. Without you, we're nothing, but with you, we can do all things. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. And if your hands are free, why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise before we're seated, and let's worship him for a moment. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. You can be seated. Overcoming the spirit of a consumer. We're going to answer the call of God. Hallelujah. How many want to answer the call of God tonight? Hallelujah. And God's been so good to me. Uh, this is, uh, I have a testimony that God's kept me through things and God's uh, protected me and God's had his hand on me and, and God's had his hand on you. Hallelujah. What an amazing God we serve. Hallelujah. He's a God of great wonders. He's a God of great power. He's a God of the miraculous. Hallelujah. He's a God of healing. He's a God of signs. He's a God of wonders. I'm not sneaking up on you with anything right here. Some of you, God's given you signs and wonders and healings. He's a delivering God. He's a saving God. He's a keeping God. Hallelujah. He's the God that brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea, and he's the God that's going to bring you through a trial, and he's the God that's going to bring you through the next difficult thing in your life. 
Hallelujah. He's the God that brought down the walls of Jericho, and he's the God that's going to bring down walls in your family and in your life. Hallelujah. He's the God that brought down a giant with a stone slung from a little shepherd boy, and he's a God that's going to bring down giants in your life. He's the God that answered prayers in the book of Acts, and he's the God that's going to answer prayers in this church in 2022. He's already answered so many prayers. What a great God he is. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a great God he is. Hallelujah. I, had a, I, had, I don't have permission to use their name. Uh, you don't even know if it was a, a man, a brother, or a sister in this church, but I got a phone call. It was either last night or it was Sunday night. I'm getting the nights confused, and they called me, and they said, I just want to give God some praise uh, for healing my body. And it was just a situation, and, and, and that person told me, I just want to give God great praise. And I'm telling you, this last weekend, there was a miracle that happened in this house while you and I were worshiping God. There was a miracle that happened in prayer service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I see Brother Ronnie here tonight. Sister Angela Miller is going to be on her way before she knows it. She might be tuned in tonight, but uh, had some tests done earlier, earlier this month, and, and there was a fearful diagnosis that was possible. But I, I just believe in all of this kind of stuff right here, but we prayed, and when the test came back, I, when the test came back, they gave her the all clear. Praise God. Thank God. I still believe that God can take things that are supposed to be one way, and he can work a miracle and everything. I still believe that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's it. Let's give God praise. He's a great God. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> this last weekend, I was around Sister Jasmine Corcoran and uh, their little boy. We prayed for them. Maybe, maybe it's getting close to two months ago now. <clears throat> little boy named Dylan and Dylan uh, they diagnosed Dylan with leukemia, and uh, I checked with her. I, I went to the hospital with their pastor, and we prayed in the hospital room right there. Little boy, young boy, and uh, doing things in the church, and, and, uh, and this, is a, this is a frightening, fearful diagnosis. And so we prayed, and uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. They did some kind of, a, of an operation, uh, and he had a, a brain bleed, and they couldn't, they couldn't go in there and fix it. And, and there, was no way that they could, there was no way they could treat it the way they normally treated it. And, uh, but we prayed, and there were several churches that prayed. And I'm telling you, when the doctors went in, they said, we don't know how that stopped, but it stopped. That brain bleed stopped. Hallelujah. Thank God. They just recently told him that he's in complete remission. He's in complete remission. Thank God. He's still a God of signs and wonders and miracles. He's a God of great miraculous power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, let's give our great God great praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And there's some of you that's got money in your pocket that you shouldn't have had, and you've got, you've got blessings that you didn't expect, and you've got open doors that you didn't know was going to be there. What a great God we serve. <laughs> hallelujah. But I'm glad that the Lord doesn't just work miracles. I don't ever want him to stop working miracles. But I'm glad that he doesn't just work those kind of miracles. I'm glad that he's a God that imparts a giftedness. I'm glad that he doesn't just come along and fix problems when we have problems. I'm glad that he imparts something to us. He gives us a giftedness to overcome things. Hallelujah. I'm glad that I'm not bound by the same things that had me bound years ago. I'm testifying for some of you right now. I, I'm glad that I've got a giftedness, that the things that used to trip me up don't trip me up anymore. He's given me a giftedness. He's given me grace. He's given me a giftedness to deal with things. He's given me the ability to defeat things that used to defeat me. What a great God. What a great God. And I, I, he, he's not just a God that works miracles when we need him. He's a God that imparts things. He gives me, he gives you a giftedness. Everybody say a giftedness. He gives us a, a capability that exceeds our own ability. And yes, I need to rely upon a great and powerful God, but I also need that great and powerful God to impart a gift to me. 
Hallelujah. Because there are things that will defeat me if I don't have a giftedness from him. I'm jumping ahead right now. Uh, it is in my nature and it is in your nature to be a consumer. And that spirit will, con it won't, it's not just me that has a consuming spirit. A consuming spirit has me and it will consume me if I don't have the ability to defeat it. Thank God that he looks down at my pitiful state, at your pitiful state and says, I've got to give them a gift so that the thing that tries to defeat them can't, but they can defeat it. I think this is what David was talking about in 2 Samuel 22. David did what we just did. In 2 Samuel 22, he did what we just did. You know, it's one of those things. I ask, if I'm letting you in on a little secret. This is an inside baseball, as Rush Limbaugh used to say, inside baseball secret. This will help us have church or it will help us not have church. This up to you. But... For the first little while in preaching, the first little while in preaching, we're trying to knock the crust off for the day. We're trying to loosen muscles up for the day. We're trying to stir faith up. So for the first 10 minutes or so of preaching, what I'm trying, he, 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 oh, he always gets up and preaches about clapping hands and worshiping. Yeah, what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is get our faith to work together. I'm trying to get us to tug back and forth. There he is, he's going to preach about praise again. Yeah, but you need to praise again. And, oh, there he is, he's going to talk about running the aisles. Yeah, but you need to run the aisles again. And, uh, yeah, oh, there he is, he's going to get us all hyped up. Well, you need to be hyped up. He's just going to try to get us to worship and praise again. Well, you, that's what you need to do. He's just going to try to preach about all this little stuff that God's great and God's, well, he is great, and you need to acknowledge that every single day of your life. And this is what David does. This is, this is what David does. It's, it, it's, in, it's in 2 Samuel 22. Uh, he he kind of goes through this list of stuff where he just talks about how great God is. It's kind of what we just did. We just got up here and we said, oh, he's a, he's a great God. He's a healing God. He's a delivering God. He's a God that breaks down walls. He's a God that kills giants. It's kind of what we just did. I want you to listen to this in 2 Samuel 22. We'll start reading in verse 29. There's some before this and there's a bunch after it. But I want you to listen to this. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. Oh, God's a light in the darkness. See, we can preach all of this right here. Uh, For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I leapt over a wall. Hallelujah. God can give you supernatural giftedness, and you can run through a troop. You can run through the troop that's after you. You can leap over a wall that was going to keep it. Maybe, I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I left you behind right there. This is what David's doing. As for God, he's talking about how great God is. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all them that trust in him. That's a piece of armor. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? Notice what he's doing. He's talking about how great God is. God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. He's given me a giftedness. I, first thing I need to do is I need to acknowledge how great he is. And then I need to acknowledge that he's given me a gift. He made my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. And setteth me upon high places. If I'm understanding this correct, and I think I am, that's a deer. Maketh my feet like hinds feet. That's a deer. And they put their back feet... When they're running, their back feet go almost perfectly where their front feet go. So that there's no slipping. It gives them, it gives them dexterity. It gives them balance. It gives them good direction. They don't stumble. They put their back feet right where their front feet, if I'm understanding what he means. He makes my feet like this. I'm able to scurry up a mountain and not slip back down. He gives me a giftedness. Y'all still with me on Tuesday night? He gives me an ability Interestingly, that we say of a deer, when you see a deer jump that rail fence, we say, oh, look at how graceful. It doesn't look like hard work. This is what God's done for you. It doesn't look like hard work when he climbs a mountain. I'll never forget, we went hunting in the mountains of Idaho, and it would take us, it'd take me an hour because the oxygen was so thin up there, and I am not thin. 
And we climbed a mountain, and it would take us an hour to climb that mountain because the oxygen was thin. Brother Johnson, we got to the top of the mountain, me and my wife's cousin, I guess he's my cousin by marriage, Brother David Bertram, we got to the top, and we're breathing hard. We got our binoculars out because we're hunting for elk. And we see some elk, not on our mountain, but all the way across the valley, way over there, like four or five miles away. And you can watch them. We're talking about grace and giftedness. And you can watch them. We watched them go from the bottom of that mountain all the way to the top. And the thing that took us an hour, an hour and 20 minutes to do, they did it in seven minutes. And they didn't stop and go, oh, oh. When they got to the top, they looked around, and then they went right over the edge. They went over the top of the mountain to the other side. That's what God has done for you. Something that used to be able to take so much effort, now you can do it with ease. This is a giftedness that God gives. He makes your feet like hinds feet. He gives you a giftedness that you shouldn't have ordinarily. Oh, this, this Holy Ghost stuff that we've got is no lightweight thing. It's the ability. It's a giftedness to walk through this world, defeating things that would normally defeat you. Yeah. Yeah. Things that I used to not be able, you hear some people testify, I used to not be able to drive past such and such establishment because that's where I used to go. But you let them live for God for four or five years and you let that giftedness grow. And thinking about going to that, it never even crosses their mind. Uh, taking a drink of this, it never even crosses their mind. Taking a snort of that, it never even holding the hand of this, reaching out for that, it never even crosses their mind because God's given them a giftedness. This is what David's talking about. Make my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. I like this one, verse 35. We're talking about giftedness that exceeds my own ability. Giftedness that exceeds your own ability. As human beings, we're not better than the other human beings that are running around down here. We have the ability to be addicted just like they're addicted. And no matter how hard we fight, the fight seems to be in vain. Remember in the 80s, I was a little kid, but I remember Nancy Reagan, President Reagan's wife, First Lady Nancy Reagan. She was helping, trying to help kids in the war on drugs. And she said, what you got to do is you got to just say no. Well, you can't just say no. You kind of got to go in a different direction. You got to have something to go to. You can't just have a no. You got to have a yes. You, oh, hallelujah. And no matter how hard we try to fight as humans, we're not better than the other humans that are running around down here. We're susceptible to the same things that they're susceptible to, Ben. We're caught by the same things they're caught by. Our humanity is not different. Our humanity is not better. But praise God, we've been filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's given us a giftedness. And so there are people that are sitting in this room that are turned, tuned in online that should be bound, but they're not bound because they've got a gift that far exceeds their own capabilities. Hallelujah. But I like this. In verse 35, he says, he teacheth my hands to war. And this is, I want you to listen to this warfare that God gives him, teaches his hands to do. It's warfare that exceeds the human ability by far. He teacheth my hands to war. Listen to how it exceeds. This is far beyond. So that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. Think about that. Go out and I challenge you. Work out for the next 10 years. Work out hard. Uh, take some workout juice that makes your muscles grow by 17 times. Develop a bad attitude. Get mean, Brother Johnson. We'll let you work out for 10 years and walk in here and I want to give you a piece of rebar. Just give you a piece of rebar. Steel. Those of you that don't know what rebar is, it's because you don't know anything about, I'm just kidding. I don't either. 
rebar. They've got rebar in the concrete of this foundation because it adds solidity, strength. And we'll give you a piece of rebar. And it doesn't matter if you've worked out for 10 years, 1,000 years. It doesn't matter if you're the strongest man on the planet. If we give you a piece of rebar, you might be able to bend it right. But you're certainly not going to be able to break it. But I want you to listen to the giftedness that God's given David. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. He's talking about the bow of his enemy, the thing that should have defeated me and the thing that I should have never been able to defeat. God has taught my hands to war to such a degree that I take it and I don't just bend it, but it's broken. Oh, come on, somebody. If you're thankful for the giftedness that God's given you. Verse 36. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Oh, we could preach about all of this. Things, shield, block. Things that used to get to me don't get to me like they used to get to me. And thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. Think about that. He's addressing things in human nature. Our feet have a tendency to slip. But God has gifted us so that when we take this step, we don't slip. And when we take the next step, we don't slip. And where everybody else slips and falls, God's giftedness keeps us from slipping. I love this. Verse 38. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them. And turned not again until I had, I like the word, until I had consumed them all. <laughs> and I have consumed them and wounded them, and they could not arise. Here's the point. Everything that was supposed to consume me, I have consumed. Is this too simple for everybody on Tuesday night? God gives such a great giftedness that everything that was supposed, when my enemy was supposed to consume me, when the bow of steel was supposed to defeat me, I consumed the consumer and I broke the breaker. And I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my Feet. What a great giftedness that the Lord gives to his children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gives us the giftedness to make the right move at the right time. He gives us the giftedness to fight the right fight and not be in the wrong fight. He gives us the, the ability to defeat everything that would normally defeat us. Hallelujah. This is what we're talking about. In James. James, in our text, is confronting writing about things that defeat or seek to defeat or seek to consume children of God. Not backsliders, people that are in the church. Not sinners. These are things that come after people that are in the church. Is it okay? Can we look at our enemy for just a second? Let's look at him in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. You've read about this. You've heard about this. I write unto you, little children. Immediately we go into warfare. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, uh, are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known them, him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. But I want you to listen. These are people that are in the church. These are overcomers. These are overcomers. Everybody say, these are overcomers. These are the people that got the Holy Ghost. I want you to notice this, what he says in verse 15. Love not the world. 
neither the things that are in the world. Sounds like, sounds like 1 John, or excuse me, 1 John sounds like James 4. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's the word cosmos there. That word cosmos. Uh, part of the definition of cosmos. It can, mean, it can mean the planet. It can mean the world that we live on. It can mean the population of the world that we live in. Part of the definition of that word cosmos means the decorated. Decorations. Uh, it's used to describe the spangling of stars. It's where we get the word cosmetic. Decoration. It's built in. It's built in. I always chuckle when people say, well, there, there's nothing in Scripture that says we can't wear makeup. Well, yes, there is a bunch of stuff in Scripture that says don't wear makeup. One of them's in the book of Revelation. You look at that woman Jezebel. You look at the great harlot that's painted up. Part of the reason we don't wear makeup is because we don't want to look like that woman. But then John also says, this, Just don't, get, don't fall in love with the decorations down here. Don't fall in love with the way the world decorates itself. I know this is a side note here, but let's just punch it since we're right here. Since we've aggravated it, let's punch it. Don't fall in love with the way they paint their self up. Don't fall in love with the way, don't fall in love with the way they decorate their singer and the way they decorate their sports and the way they, don't fall in love with all of that. And James said, if you love the world, the love of the world is enmity with God. It's not one foot in and one foot out. No, 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 no. There's no neutral ground. You can't ride the fence. You either, you're either the enemy of the world or you're the enemy of God. I didn't say it. James did. When we get to heaven, if you don't like what James said, take it up with him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Boy, it got quiet there. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here's our enemy. He puts it in three categories. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. There's that word epitumio, lust. The inordinate desires of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eye, epitumio, the inordinate lust of the eye. It's one thing to notice that he's good looking or that she's pretty. But the lust of the eye can go much further than that. Lust of the flesh, it's one thing to want such and such. Uh, it's one thing to want to achieve certain things. And it's another thing for that thing to consume you to such a degree that it affects your worship and it affects this and it affects that. And before you know it, you're not showing up at the house of God. And before you know it, you're in a fight with somebody over here. And the pride of life. For all that is in the world, all that is in the cosmos, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of, not, of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. Since we're preaching about it this way tonight, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest enemies one of the greatest things that defeats good children of God. If somebody were to ask me, you got any evil saints in your church? I would say no. I don't have any evil ones. This doesn't defeat evil saints. This defeats good saints. Did I say something funny? All the evil people are the ones laughing at me right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All of you laughed. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. One of the things that defeats children of God is a consumer spirit. Where we're serving God for what we can get out of this. You think I can... You think I'm kidding here, but I've actually spoken with good people, smart people, intelligent people, people that grew up in church. And they'll say, well, 
God didn't heal. I might as well quit. I've, I've heard that with my own mouth. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and he didn't answer my prayer. Anybody else? Am I the only one that's ever heard that? Or something similar? Things didn't work out. I've known people to backslide because they didn't get the girl they wanted to get. I've known people to backslide because they didn't get the position that they wanted to get. Yeah, following him for the loaves and the fishes. Brother Wells could preach this. As long as he's feeding me, as long as he's healing my body, as long as he's opening the right door that I think he ought to open, as long as he's doing this or doing that, well, let me ask you a question. Would, he serve, would you serve him if he never fed you again? Would you serve him if you've had your last blessing? Would you serve him if your life from here on is not going to be anything but a fight? Yeah, he's been so good to me. I can't stop serving him now. If that's how you feel, would you just give God praise for a moment? Hallelujah. God, you're so good. One of the greatest things that defeats us and it's like a cat that's got nine lives. The spirit. You can't kill it once and for all. Brother Wiley cuts the grass here at the church. Does a fantastic job. How many love Brother Wiley? But down here in the south, from about mid-March till about mid-October, you can't cut the grass one and done. You got to go. Some of, Brother Wells said, I've tried that. It's one of those things. You cut it, especially if it rains. Man, if it rains and then it's followed by a little deep south humidity. Grass that you cut yesterday has already got flowers on top of it in the morning. <laughs> it's one of those things. You cut it today, check it tomorrow. By the end of the week, you're going to say, yep, yeah, I'm going to have to cut it again on Monday. Whenever you cut the grass. It's one of those deals. A consumer spirit. A consumer spirit. I've heard people, my wife and I have talked to people and literally say, I just don't feel God anymore. And I don't, I just, something's wrong. How about this? Why don't you get out in the aisle and worship him until you do feel him? Why does it always have to be him blessing you? Why don't you learn how to bless the Lord at all times? Whether you feel him or you don't feel him. Hallelujah. Why don't you defeat a consumer mentality that says, I'm working for him. He doesn't work for me. Everything I get from him is a benefit because I was a rotten, low-down, dirty, rotten skunk, and he pulled me up out of the muck and the mire. Amen. We'll preach this one of these days and just act like you've never heard it. But it's kind of, we're caught in this tension. We're caught in this tension that's rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Yeah. And we run the aisles. We're rejoicing in the Lord. And we dance in the aisles. And we're rejoicing in the Lord. And we lay in the altar. And we rejoice in the Lord. And we have a miracle. And we rejoice in the Lord. That's one end of the tension that we live in. The other end of it is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Both of those. Both of those are in, in, in the life of a child of God. I want you to notice how powerful, how perfect our God is. Our God can say, one th can say two things about the same thing, and both of them be right, and they look like they contradict one another. Living for God's rejoicing in the Lord always. Man, my wife and I in this church, we grew up, the, the kingdom of heaven is a party. How many are thankful that we don't, we're not a part of something that's dead and dull and dried up? This is a party. This is great. At the same time, there's this side of it that's work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what Paul told the Philippians. Did I get that light? That's what you yeah. That's what Paul told the Philippians. If it wasn't the Philippians, it was one of them. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's part of what this is. That's part of what this is. Rejoice in the Lord always. But what if there's nothing to rejoice about? I'm not living for God as a consumer. 
My God is not my belly. I, that's not, that wasn't in there. I know we've already preached that. This is not about satisfying my appetite or satisfying my cravings. And if I never feel it again, I'm still going to worship him because he's worthy. Not because he blessed me, but because he's God. But people that have a consumer mentality, have a consumer spirit, it goes beyond a mentality. They have a consumer spirit. Uh, I thought when I lived for God, I was going to be happy. No. Sometimes it's great sorrow. I wish we didn't have to bury, uh, well, this last weekend, I wish we didn't have to bury Brother Oliver Haygood. Sometimes there's grief, but we're going to serve God anyway. And people that have a consumer spirit. Jordan, sit down. I'm going to preach for a long time. People that have a consumer spirit are people, they are some of the most, they are some of the most thoroughly defeated people you'll ever see in your life. And what's amazing is that it never occurs to them that they're defeated. They're some of the smartest people and some of the most thoroughly defeated people you'll ever meet in your life. You talk to them, and man, wisdom can come off of their lips. Like, But they are some of the most thoroughly defeated people you will ever see in your life because they, they serve God with a consumer spirit. And that consumer spirit's a sneaky thing. That's a sneaky thing. It never comes out and introduces itself. Hello, my name is Consumer Spirit, and you and I are going to hang out for a while. It never does that. It never does that. It sneaks in while you're sleeping. Uh, it gets in the back of the truck and hides under the spare tire that you got back there. It's a consumer spirit. It's a cons it wrecks marriages. Yeah, here we go, meddling. A consumer spirit wrecks marriages because you thought she was supposed to make you happy. Or you thought he was supposed to meet such and such need, and he, what if God, what if he, if for some reason his, he's physically, he's, he's in a car accident, and he's, he's invalid, what, are you still married to him? What if he can't earn another dollar? It defeats marriages. It defeats young people. People that have a consumer spirit, Get offended quicker than anybody because they they feel like something is due to them. And if you ask them, do you feel entitled? Well, no. And they're not lying to you. It's sneakier than that. They haven't come to terms. They haven't looked inside and said, you know, I feel entitled to this, and it's just not happening until it comes out later. They seem totally normal until it comes out later. I, listen, there's a spirit that keeps cropping up in this church that when it finally exhibits itself, it does so with fury. I've mentioned this before. It's a spirit that when it finally manifests itself, it does so with fury and with bitterness. I've seen it multiple times. We've dealt with it in the office. It's furious. It's based in a consumer Spirit. Well, it got quiet in here. Why'd you have to bring up that fury stuff? Because James did. James said, why is all this fighting going on among you? Where are these wars coming from? Is it not from this epitumio? Is it not from these lusts that you have? Is it not from this consumer spirit that's got you? I'm telling you, it'll defeat you completely. It'll defeat any man. It'll defeat any woman of God. It'll defeat so completely. But we're here tonight squaring off, facing up, head button, throwing punches, kicking, fighting, screaming. We're going to defeat the spirit of a consumer. We're not just here for what God can do for us. We're here for what we can do for God. I think we ought to just give God praise for just a moment. Come on, let's lift up our voice for just a moment and give him great praise. Hallelujah! 
Listen, this is why it ought not to be based on how you feel when you come to the house of God. Get out and dance in the aisle anyway. It not, ought not to take a bunch of pumping and priming from the service leader. It should just take the slightest little nudge. It should just take the slightest little prompting. And all of a sudden, there's dancing in my feet. Even if my feet feel heavy, there's clapping in my hands. Even if my spirit's down. Because I didn't come here with a consumer spirit. I came here because he's great and he's God. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'll close my eyes. Pastor, I just don't feel it tonight. So what? Sometimes I don't feel it and you still expect me to get up here and preach. Let that be stricken from the record. Sometimes you get, sometimes you sit straight up in bed at 3.30 in the morning. And it's not because you got to get up and go to work like hardworking men like Brother Ricky Morgan and Trevor and get up at 3.30 so they can drive for two hours or whatever. But you sit up at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I don't feel like praying right now. Yeah, but if you pray, I'll give you a breakthrough. Don't worry about what to do. Don't, don't have a consumer spirit. Don't worry about how this is going to benefit you. Why don't you trade everything that you think is going to benefit you? As James said it, why don't you afflict yourself? Why don't you break yourself? Why don't you, why don't you humble yourself? Why don't you get down on your knees and pray whether you feel like it or not? Don't serve God with a consumer spirit. Yeah. So let me, let me, you can be seated. I'll, I'll just give you three real quick. We could probably preach about 20 of these things. You'll recognize it. These are great people in here. You'll recognize it. Jordan, come help me. We're, we'll, we'll, we're probably 15 minutes from closing, but it'll help me. So I tried to, this was too big. When I started thinking about the ways or the ways that a consumer spirit manifests itself, it got too big. It was massive. Let me just give you, let me just give you two or three. Can you handle two or three before we go home? I mean, good grief. We, the Lord may come back in the morning. He may come back tonight while we're sleeping. Let's, let's go out in a blaze of glory. Or at least go out listening to the word if it's not a blaze of glory. Consumer spirit. Uh, God gives us a giftedness. How do we defeat a consumer spirit? You can't do it with your natural man. You can't outrun it. If you know jujitsu, you can't throw it. If you know karate, you can't karate chop it. You can't punch it in the face. You can't. You can't cut it with the knife. If you're going to defeat a consumer spirit, you got to do it with the giftedness of God. You got to do it with hands that have been taught to war. You got to do it with feet that operate like hinds' feet. Oh, sometimes you have to pray. Well, you always have to pray. But sometimes you have to pray with, with revelation, with with thinking in your mind, in your spirit. You have to pray with a purpose, even if you're praying in other tongues. You can pray about things in other tongues and it still be in your, it, it, part, of your uh, part of your conscious man. I, that's the best I can say it. Your mind can be aware of what you're praying about, but you don't know what you're praying about. You're praying beyond your understanding is what Paul talked about tongues as. Don't ever underestimate coming to the Lord and praying until you're talking in other tongues. Just go there with revelation sometimes and say, God, I'm bringing my consumer spirit and I'm praying until you give me a giftedness to deal with it. Hey, I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, he can give you a giftedness to deal with any kind of addiction. If you don't believe me, Well, man, there's people in this world that can almost talk you out of being addicted. 
That's why these 12-step programs get all kinds of people to come. It, you, they talk to your inner man to the point where you believe, okay, wait, I can recover from this. How much greater the Spirit of God who has never been addicted to anything and is not subject to anything down here. And you have to pray until you get in touch with that. But you can... This is the deal, Brother Wells. James said you can pray and pray amiss. You can live life like a consumer and you can pray like a consumer. Said you have not. He's talking about praying. Said you have not because you ask not. Let me stop right here for just a moment and tell you. I think we can pray, and if we pray sincerely and we ask God sincerely, I think God can move mountains. I think God could fill this entire section up in a Sunday. I think God could triple your income in an instant if you prayed about it. It's that simple. James said you have not because you ask not. Then he added something. He said, it's that simple. If you prayed about it, you'd get it. And then he said, and you have not because you ask amiss. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. That ye may consume it upon your, it's the same word, epithumio, upon your desires that are so big that they control you instead of you controlling them. How is it that, the, that, the, that it can be flipped around where I'm in control of those things? You can't do it unless you get a giftedness from God. It's a giftedness from God that keeps us where we can serve him and not have a consumer spirit. Church, don't ever underestimate coming to Monday night prayer. Well, I was tired. I know. I know. I know. And I know we do it on Monday nights, and I've often thought about that. But if I tried to do it on Monday afternoon, everybody's working. <laughs> and if I tried to do it on Friday night, everybody's partying. I mean, in a good way. They're taking their wife or their husband out on a date on Friday night. Don't ever underestimate when you go to your closet and pray. You're defeating a consumer spirit. Just the act of getting down on your knees defeats a consumer spirit. I don't know about you, but my flesh has never enjoyed praying. I mean, there's a point where you get a breakthrough, yeah, but I'm talking about actually making it come to the prayer room and come to the prayer closet and kneel down. My flesh never wants to. I haven't got to that place. I haven't got to that place yet where David said, My flesh longeth for thee. Oh, Dave. He's good at it. Don't ever underestimate praying through, and you have to do it with a consciousness, with a mentality. I'm going to pray through my consumer spirit. So here's a couple things. There's things that defeat us. Children of God, not sinners. Children of God, it defeats children of God. Uh... Money will defeat us. But God gives us a giftedness. As soon as I say these things, you're going to be like, oh, good grief. Here it is. God gives us a giftedness. I've seen people, as they get a few thousand bucks, every, every time they get a few thousand bucks, that's, where'd they go? Well, I've seen them. Well, we'll leave that alone. But God gives us a giftedness. He gives us a gift to deal with that spirit, the love of which is the root of all evil. 
God gives us a spirit, a greater ability, an ability that goes beyond. Well, what was that gift? Well, well, he gives us a commandment. He gives us a commandment first to pay your tithe and your offering. I'm going to tell you, if you're having trouble paying your tithe and your offering, the simple way to preach this is just say, look, if you're not paying your tithe and your offering when the trumpet sounds, you're staying down here and the rest of us are going. Uh, you're not going to rob God and get away with it. But that's the simple way to say it. Let's add a little profundity to this. Let's put it back in the context of being a consumer. I had a man come to my office one time. He's not in the room tonight. He might see this, but he came to my office one time and we were talking and he said, I'm dealing with this in my marriage. I'm dealing with this. It, it, uh, I'm not going to name the situation. Thank God he's been delivered. And I'm dealing with this with my kids. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with this. He named off like six or seven things and I stopped him. We didn't even talk about this. The Holy Ghost helped me. Anybody ever had the Holy Ghost help you? And I said, brother, I said, it sounds like you're not paying your tithe. It sounds like you're not paying your tithe. And he said, well, you know, he said, I'm a little behind on that right now. I said, how far behind are you? Uh, it, was a, it was a bunch. He said I, 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 he said, I had to pay bills and I had to pay people that had done some work for him. I said, brother, I said, get the, get the people that hold the bills, get the people that hold your mortgage mad at you, but don't get God mad at you. Let the people that did work for you be mad at you, but don't let God be mad at you. Now, you might need to handle some things financially a little bit better so that you can, don't get God mad at you. Here's what, my, uh, here's what Malachi said. It, there's a devourer that gets loose in your home, a consumer. You pay your tithe and your offering, and God said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll rebuke the spirit of a consumer for your sake. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. You just start paying. You just start obeying that commandment. You start paying your tithe and your offering, and things that used to be a temptation to you aren't a temptation to you anymore. Boy, I felt that tighten up on me for just a second. Let me stop and just preach to somebody. You're, some of you are cutting blessings off in your life simply because you're not obeying God's commandment to give 10% to pay the first fruits to him in tithe and in offering. It's a consumer spirit that's got you, and none of it belongs to you. It all belongs to God. I always laugh when I hear people say, i got to give God his. No, 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 come on. All of it's his. All of it's his. Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You and I don't even have the right to think our own thoughts. That brain belongs to him. That consumer mentality will defeat you so completely. And it's so sneaky. It's so sneaky. I'm preaching to somebody right now that if you don't defeat this, my dear friend, you don't even know if it's a lady or a man. If you don't defeat this, it'll be 15 years from now, and we'll be trying to reach your kids, and they'll all be out of our reach. They'll be so consumed, and they'll be consumed with the very things you're consumed with. If you go to heaven, this is the way Jesus said it. If you go in halt, or if you go in without an eye, pluck your eye out if it offends you. Just make it in. Let me preach it to you in 2022. Go in broke. Go in without possessions. Go in without a shirt on your back. But just make it in. And let your kids see this world down here doesn't, I'm not consumed by the things of this world. So that's, that's one way. Boy, oh, I'm telling you, it's tightened up, so I'm punching this one in the face. You let God look at your checkbook. You have, you have, you as a man, as a woman, have the courage to look at you, look at where most of your money's going. Let us put, let me just put us under conviction in here. Did you know that over the last five years, 
There's enough money going out in phone bills in this room tonight, and we don't even have the whole congregation here because of sickness. There's enough money going out in phone bills. to have more than paid this church off. God lives tight on me right there. I got a phone bill too. I'm not picking on you. Maybe you just ran the aisle. Hey, I'm going to tell you. This consumer spirit stuff, it'll kill you. It'll kill a church. It'll kill a revival. It'll kill blessings. I'm going to tell you. If we can ever break it, We've had moments where we've seen it flash so brilliantly. Uh, let me just stop. I'm off my notes. This has to go beyond just obeying a commandment, though. There's a giftedness that rides the back of a spirit called generosity. Where it's not just obeying a commandment, but it's giving cheerfully. And I don't just mean to the offering. Look, we're preaching for a long time. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. I'm headbutting a spirit tonight. Brother, one of my favorite people in the whole world, Brother Harold Sargent, goes to Brother Rick Mayo's church in Spokane, Washington. I think he lives in Idaho. It's only about 20 minutes away. Brother Sargent had three boys, Darren, Dalen, and Derek. And they used to, they used to have this deal that they did and they didn't, they weren't, they're not millionaires now. They had this deal that they did. Brother Sergeant and his boys, Sister Sergeant, they'd go buy a bunch of groceries and cool stuff for people that were in need. And they'd pack it all up in the vehicle and they'd drive it and they'd go sneaking up to the house, all those little boys. And they'd sneak up and they'd set it all up on the, on the front porch. And they'd all back up. And one of them would stand there and they'd ring the doorbell and they'd all run and hide in the bushes. They'd park the car down the road and they'd hide in the bushes. And they said, we'd watch people come out and they'd look at those groceries and they didn't know how they was going to feed their kids for the next however long. And they knew they didn't have anything coming on their own because of their own ability. And they said, those people would begin to cry on the floor. He said, we did that so many times. He said, my kids got to, got to where they enjoyed giving things away more than they enjoyed getting things. We're talking about defeating a consumer mentality. Generosity is the giftedness that goes beyond just obeying a commandment. Could you imagine the revival if we broke this one spirit right here? Could you imagine the revival if every one of us would start cooking a roast beef dinner or some of us would make a hamburger plate and take it over to our neighbor's house or we'd buy somebody's groceries? Did I say something wrong right there? Hallelujah. Generosity is that giftedness. It's teaching my hands to war. I can break a bow of steel. That which would have consumed me so completely, I can break it with. I can. It's far beyond my capability to break that to break that bow of steel. It's far beyond my ability to defeat my own enemy. But I consumed them, is what David said. And then we need to worship something. Humans need to worship. It's part of our consumer nature. We need to worship something. <laughs> and we oh. and so we consume with our eyes. There, there's, a whole, there's a whole theology here, and we've already preached way too long. We consume with our eyes. Lust of the eye. That's the stuff we're covering here. We consume with our eyes. I'm not, but I'm about ready. I'm about ready to start preaching against cell phones, that watching stuff on your cell phone, even if it's innocuous. It feeds a consumer mentality. It feeds a consumer mentality. 
because we consume with our eyes. As much as we consume with our mouth, we consume with our eyes. This, uh, it's the whole idea behind idolatry. You want to know what another a word for an idol is? An image. It's that which we consume with our eyes. You got to watch what you're looking at. Church, you got to watch what you're looking at. Get off YouTube if you got to get off YouTube. Get off that app. Get off of it. And there might be 15 things that they invent this year. And we consume it on Instagram and we consume it on Facebook and we consume it on Twitter. And on the news site, oh, he's preaching against the news. Yeah, because sometimes some of you walk in here completely bound up because you've been consuming things with your eyes. Things that's going on in this world. But God gives us a gift that goes beyond a commandment to watch our eyes. And we've got them. God gives us a gift that defeats a consumer mentality, that defeats a consumer spirit. And it's a gift called faith. You know what faith is? It's a walk, and it's not by sight. <laughs> and you want to know how to increase your faith? We don't pray to an image, even if it's got an orange and blue or a crimson and white helmet on. We don't consume that with our eyes. But we worship a God that we haven't seen yet. But we worship in faith, waiting on a day when he shall appear. And when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him. I don't have time to preach all of that. And then, man, I tried to use kind words here, but personal agendas consume us. I've seen people man great people I, listen these aren't people that I'm preaching against I'm not mad at them these are great people I've seen people that are so bent out of shape right now because they're not standing behind this pulpit there's people that aren't living for God because they thought such and such position or such and such my wife and I know a man he lives in another state. Kind of called himself the pastor. And uh, came out of the, came out of the, well, I'm not going to say what church. We knew him well. And he went and started his own church, started a couple of them. Started a couple of them. That sounds like a good thing. But he did it, he did it as a consumer. It was what, that was, yeah, pastor. Today, Brother Wells, he's lost his wife. He's lost his children. He's lost his income. Those churches that he started, he's lost those. He's less than when he went out. He's consumed. He's consumed. So how do we... How do we defeat personal agendas? How do we defeat personal agendas? Well, you defeat personal agendas, Brother Wells, Brother Brantley, Brother Artis, great people of God, great men and women of God. You defeat personal agendas by answering the call of God. By doing the will of God. What's the will of God? What's the will of God? Well, there's a will of God that's long-term, but we'll just preach about this one right here because it's close to us. The will of God is to do the present task at hand. That's the way those elders used to talk about it. If it needs doing, do it. I thank God. I thank God that we've got incredible service leaders here and incredible musicians. And I, I can play the drums and the radio. If I had to, I'd get up here and lead us in singing. Thank God we don't have to. But if leading and singing is what needs to be done, I'll lead in singing. And if holding the door open is what needs to be done, I'll hold the door open. 
And if praying all night is what needs to be done, I'll pray all night. And if cutting the grass is what needs to be done, I'll cut the grass. Because in the kingdom of heaven, cutting the grass is as great as preaching the sermon. What do you mean cutting the grass is as great as preaching a sermon? Because that man that's cutting the grass, Brother Wiley, for us, every time they drive down Highway 69, and there's something that that spirit is speaking, yeah, we're going to make our church look as good as it can possibly look because it's a testimony to this area. And I could probably be making all kinds of money doing something else, but I'm not possessed of a consumer spirit. Thanks for preaching with me, Brother Wiley. All you Sunday school teachers, thanks for preaching. All of you K-12 through teachers, Thanks for preaching. Thanks for preaching with me. Sister Christy, don't give up preaching your sermon with me. Babe, don't give up preaching your sermon with me. Brother Chase, wherever you're working, don't give up preaching your sermon. That's how you overcome a, that's how you overcome a personal agenda will consume you. Pride of life. It'll consume you. So you're not serving God. Because he's God and because he's great. Is this preaching too long? If you need to go, you can go home. We're talking about overcoming a consumer spirit and not serving God with a consumer spirit. And my personal agenda will consume me so thoroughly. It'll have me fighting with my wife. It'll have me fighting with you. I'll get offended about things. I'm putting it on me right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that you know to apply this. to. I, I, I'll get offended about things that you did and you didn't even know you did it. It's a devourer. It's a consumer. How do I defeat a consumer spirit? You have to look for that. You, you're, you're so brilliant. The men and women in this room are so incredibly attuned to the Word of God. All you got to do is think about the gifted. You can think about it immediately. I can, we could come up with 10 or 15 examples tonight, and you can think about the thing that absolutely defeats it. It's the exact opposite of the thing that consumes. And the way you defeat a personal agenda is to crucify your agenda and say, I'm following you. I'm answering your call, God. I'll close with this. When I was a teenager, maybe several of you in this room went to this as well. When I was a teenager, there was a life-altering experience for me. We went on a we went on a missions trip. Brother Gordon Mallory, I love him, Brother and Sister Mallory. Come. It reminds me of a place where I learned to defeat a consumer mentality. Y'all still with me tonight? I went, when I went on that trip, I was so blessed. I was up. Not physically back then, but emotionally I was, I, I was just so blessed in every way. Great mom and dad ate good every day, had a bunch of clothes. I took, I took two suitcases with me to the Philippines, turned 19 twice on that trip, legitimately. We were on one side of the international date line, and on November 16th, I turned from 18 to 19, and I went to all the restaurants and said, hey, today's my birthday. And they gave me all the stuff, and we flew to Hawaii, and we crossed the international date line. It was November 16th again. I said, hey, today's my birthday. <laughs> I went with all my clothes and all my shoes had my hair combed cool and we went over there Brother Wells and there's Pentecostals living in cardboard boxes there was Bible school kids Stacked up in dorm rooms, and some of them didn't even have beds. And if they were lucky, they had the clothes they were wearing and another change of clothes. Most of them didn't really have all that much. Ate a lot of rice. 
if I eat rice, I'm eating rice underneath something else. They ate a lot of rice. And dogs. They ate dogs. I ate Brother Mallory's dog one time. Came home and said, hey, where's my dog? And I said, oh, Brother Mallory, he went into the ministry. Anyway. <laughs> we're supposed to be serious right now. <laughs> Talk about consumers. Those boys were hungry. <laughs> I went in there. The Bible school, I don't know if it's still there. It didn't even have a well. They had to import their own water. I spoke to the missionary, and he said, man, you know what would be the biggest help? He said, if, if we could have some people that would send money and we could dig a well right here on this Bible school ground. I didn't even drink my water from the tap. Bottled water, please. They made the equivalent of 20 American dollars a week. <laughs> I gave some of them a $20 tip while I was there, blew their mind. We went to church. The preacher got up. And he preached about the process that God uses for ministry. The process of answering the call of God. He said, and it's the same process that God has with bread. You read it. He said he took it, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he handed it out. He said, we love the blessing because we're consumers. He said, we hate the breaking, and we hate being passed out. He said, but that's how God answering the call of God works. And he said, he preached. I'll never forget the Holy Ghost, Brother Ronnie Miller washing into that room and all of those young men no young ladies at this one all of those young men Sister Hannah that didn't have half didn't have 10% of what I had as a person came to the altar and I could hear them praying God because I spoke English broken English at least to us it was broken God, break me and pass me out to those that need you. And some of those men are missionaries in their own country now, pastors, church planners. Church, I don't want to be, I don't want a consumer spirit. I want to answer the call of God. Am I preaching to anybody in the house tonight? Does anybody feel what the Holy Ghost is trying to do for us? This isn't something to feel heavy about. This is him teaching your hands to war. This is how you defeat a consumer spirit. A spirit that would consume you, this is how you defeat it. You answer the call of God. How do I answer the call of God? Do what needs to be done. Well, tell me what needs to be done. No, no, God, I, I will. Bishop will. Leaders will. But sometimes you'll see it and we won't see it. Just do it. Sometimes you can reach them and we don't even know them. Just reach them. Sometimes you can pray for them and we don't even know who they are. Pray for them. Sometimes you can fast and the pastor not call it. Just fast. Sometimes you could teach a Bible study, preach a sermon, heal. You could do it. Hallelujah. Let's just pray right now for just a moment. I don't know what else to do here, and I'm done. I'm done with everything that I've got prepared, but the Holy Ghost is in here. Let's just reach out to him for just a moment. I wonder if we can lift our voice all over this house. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. They're going to sing as they sing. This altar's open. Come. God's given you a gift tonight. I will be what you've called me to be. I'll say Call.
Let's lift our voice. While they sing it, let's reach out to him. That's what I'll be. 